Walter Kenyon was a pastor in the United Presbyterian Church in the United States of America, and of his 11 children, three of them too would become UPC pastors. One of those was his third oldest son, Wynne. Wynne graduated with honors from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary, and in 1974, he sought ordination. At the presbytery level, his ordination was controversial, but he was approved on a vote of 147 to 133. However, his ordination was appealed from there to the denomination's highest court, the Permanent Judicial Commission of the General Assembly. There, Wynne's ordination was overturned. And what was the reason that Wynne was refused ordination in the United Presbyterian Church? Wynne said that he would be fine to be in a church that chose to ordain a woman, but he himself would not participate in a woman's ordination. To this, the High Court said, refusal to ordain women on the basis of their sex is contrary to the Constitution. This was only 18 years after the first woman had been ordained as a minister in the Northern U.S. Presbyterian Church body, before which the practice wasn't allowed at all. Ultimately, the Kenyan family preachers would all leave the UPC and Wynne himself ended up in the Presbyterian Church in America, a denomination which doesn't ordain women. But the refusal to allow ministers to follow their conscience on this issue was troubling to some in the United Presbyterian Church. The UPC USA only reinforced this when they proceeded to pass Overture L, disallowing any UPC USA church from refusing to ordain women as ruling elders. Two other events in their church increased the tension. In 1980, Mansfield Caseman sought ordination, and when questioned by his presbytery, he was asked, Is Jesus God? He responded, No, God is God. He followed up later with, Saying Jesus is one with God is a better way of saying it, but I too am one with God. The presbytery ordained Caseman, and his ordination too was appealed. He was accused of also denying Christ's sinlessness and bodily resurrection, but ultimately the same high court that rejected Kenyon approved Caseman, who recently has celebrated the 50-year anniversary of that ordination. In his trial, Caseman said, For me, the God worth knowing is found more in the integrity of love than the purity of dogma, more in quest of liberation than the pursuit of orthodoxy, and more in the process of becoming than in the satisfaction of having arrived. Also, around that time, the UPC USA adopted a trust clause that would make all church property belong to the denomination, meaning that churches which might attempt to leave would have to forfeit their property to the denomination. These three issues were in sharp focus as some pastors concerned with liberal trends in the denomination met in prayer meetings. Another issue also loomed, the upcoming potential merger of their denomination with another Presbyterian denomination, the Presbyterian Church in the U.S. Ultimately, that merger would happen a few years later in 1983, forming today's Presbyterian Church USA. But in 1981, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church began. By 1982, there were only 35 churches, but that grew a decade later to 174, and today there are over 600. They say of themselves, we are unique among American Presbyterians with our self-conscious attempt to balance essential and non-essential matters within a confessional framework. We are unified in our commitment to the essentials of the historic Christian faith taught in the Bible, but allow liberty of conscience on those matters which are not so plain in or central to the Bible's teaching. As for confessional documents, they say, the Westminster Confession of Faith and Catechisms are constitutional documents of the Evangelical Presbyterian Church and must be subscribed to by all ministers, elders, and deacons. And also, the Westminster Confession of Faith constitutes a system of biblical truth that an officer of the EPC is required to believe, acknowledging that each individual court has the freedom to allow exceptions that do not infringe upon the system of doctrine in the Westminster Confession of Faith. The Westminster Confession has been slightly modified by the EPC, as it was by many other American Presbyterian denominations, which you can learn about in my video on that topic. For example, two new chapters not in the original were added in 1903 by the PCUSA, and the EPC has also adopted them. The EPC also updated the WCF into modern English. The Trinity is affirmed, and of Jesus it is said, Jesus Christ, the living word, became flesh through his miraculous conception by the Holy Spirit and his virgin birth. He who is true God became true man, united in one person forever. He died on the cross, a sacrifice for our sins, according to the scriptures. On the third day, he arose bodily from the dead, ascended into heaven, where, at the right hand of the majesty on high, he now is our high priest and mediator. They affirm the five solas of the Reformation, stating them this way on their website. God's grace alone 
alone as the only way to be reconciled to God, faith alone as the only means of receiving God's grace, Christ alone as the ground of God's saving grace, Scripture alone as the only infallible authority for belief, and God's glory alone as the ultimate purpose for the lives of men and women. There are two sacraments, baptism and the Lord's Supper. Under normal circumstances, an ordained minister should administer them. Infants and children unable to profess faith are baptized, as well as previously unbaptized adults who profess faith. By the act of baptism, a person becomes a part of the visible church. Normally, the congregation stands as godparents, but there can also be specified godparents who are part of the congregation. On the effects of baptism, it is stated, effectiveness. Baptism is not necessary for salvation, as some who are baptized will be lost and others who are not baptized will be saved. Yet, it is a sin to neglect this sacrament as God promises to bless his people through it. Grace is not tied to the moment of baptism. Pouring, sprinkling, and immersion are all acceptable modes. Immersion is least common. Rebaptism is not done. Of this, the BCO says, since it is not dependent upon the devoutness or the intention of the person administering it, baptism should be administered only once. Churches have two membership roles, a baptized role and active role. Anyone baptized who has not made a profession of faith is on the former. Once they have been confirmed and made a public profession of faith, they are on the active role, at which point they may vote in congregational meetings. On the nature of the Lord's Supper, it is stated, The Lord's Supper is in no way a re-offering of Christ, nor a sacrifice. It commemorates Christ's once-for-all offering of himself, and in celebrating the sacrament, the people offer praise to God for what has already been done. The elements remain blood and wine, but Christ is spiritually present. Of the frequency of communion, the EPC says, as often as each Lord's Day, but no less than quarterly. Communion is open for all professing Christians. Children may participate after making a profession of faith. The scripture is the 66 books of the Bible. It is inspired, infallible, and the supreme authority. On creation, the Westminster Confession says, In the beginning it pleased God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit to create the world out of nothing in order to reveal the glory of his eternal power, wisdom, and goodness. He made everything in the world visible and invisible in the space of six days, and it was very good. After God had made all the other creatures, he created man, male and female, with reasoning immortal souls. The EPC has not expanded on this statement or made any requirements that ministers must take a strict literalist approach to creation, so various views on creation and and evolution are present. The confession also says that Adam and Eve sinned, and as a result, their guilt, death, and sin, and corrupt nature is passed to all people. On salvation, the EPC says, Being estranged from God and condemned by our sinfulness, our salvation is wholly dependent upon the work of God's free grace. God credits his righteousness to those who put their faith in Christ alone for their salvation, and thereby justifies them in his sight. Only such as are born of the Holy Spirit and receive Jesus Christ become children of God and heirs of eternal life. As part of the Presbyterian Reformed tradition, the EPC affirms a Calvinist soteriology, including total depravity, unconditional election, limited atonement, irresistible grace, and perseverance of the saints. For example, they state, Before the foundation of the earth, God chose some to be objects of his undeserved favor. His choice of particular sinners for salvation was not based upon any foreseen act or response on the part of those selected. That is, it was not conditioned on anything that we do. And also, the popular phrase is accurate, once saved, always saved. The elect are eternally secure in Christ. Indeed, Romans 8, 35-39 says forcefully, nothing can separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus. On sanctification, the Westminster Confession affirms it as something that takes place for the believer and denies that it is complete or perfect in this life. On spiritual gifts and charismatism, the EPC says, we believe the Holy Spirit is active today in applying the benefits of Christ's redemption and equipping the church for service through the granting of spiritual gifts, including the gifts of office. We believe the church should encourage God's people to to serve him with all the gifts the Spirit gives. The EPC consists of churches that believe the charismatic gifts are still given today, as well as churches that do not. This would be a prime example of a non-essential. We believe that the baptism of the Holy Spirit is part of the new birth, but that every believer is commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit as part of the ongoing work of God's grace. In the EPC position paper on the Holy Spirit, they say, Some would require that Christians manifest a particular gift, such as speaking in tongues, as evidence of a deeper work of the Spirit within. As a Reformed denomination, we adhere strongly to our belief in the sovereignty of God, a belief that does not allow us either to require a certain gift or to restrict the Spirit in how he will work. Rather, we call upon all Christians 
Christians to open their lives unto God's Spirit to fill, empower, and gift as he sees fit. Additionally, in that position paper, they ask, is the EPC charismatic? And answer, if you mean, are we Pentecostal? The answer is no. If you mean, are we open to the gifts of the Holy Spirit? The answer is yes. That being said, in the vast majority of EPC churches, you will not expect to see public practice of speaking in tongues or regular use of predictive prophecy. On end times, the EPC's document on the essentials says Jesus Christ will come again to the earth personally, visibly, and bodily to judge the living and the dead and to consummate history and the eternal plan of God. Even so come Lord Jesus. Beyond this, the EPC has very little to say. The statement leaves room for various positions, such as amillennialism and postmillennialism, as well as historic premillennialism. On human sexuality, the EPC's position paper on the topic says, We desire to adhere fully to biblical sexuality. Out of love, we share with others the message of God's judgment upon all forms of sexual immorality. We also believe that there is no place for any form of cruelty, hate, or denigration of those who either disagree with these positions or hold to other positions. They say also, God directs his people who marry to wed only fellow believers, those who trust in Jesus Christ alone for salvation, and have joined his church. For those who desire to be a person of the opposite gender, they say that they should keep the gender given at conception. Some of the things listed as sinful sexual practices include extramarital sex, adultery, polygamy, unbiblical divorce and remarriage, homosexual conduct, same-sex union and marriage, and gender reassignment. In the same paper, they state, In the name of Jesus, our compassionate Savior, we tenderly welcome all, regardless of their belief or lifestyles, to attend our churches. On remarriage, they say, Marriage should be as long as a couple lives. However, due to human weakness and sin, gross and persistent denial of marriage vows, which are unrepented of, may be grounds for separation and divorce. Remarriage may be sanctioned by the church in keeping with the redemptive gospel when penitence is clear and a resolve to do a Christian marriage right is evident. Divorced persons should examine themselves to see if remaining unmarried may be God's vocation for them. Divorce is permitted only in circumstances of grave repudiation of the marriage covenant, namely adultery and willful irremediable desertion. The offended party in such circumstances is free to remarry as if the offending party were dead. Those who remarry after an improper divorce commit adultery and are subject to church discipline. However, when one of the spouses in a former union remarries, we may conclude that the other is free to remarry because the former marriage relationship has been permanently broken by the remarriage. On abortion, the EPC's policy paper on the topic says in part, The Evangelical Presbyterian Church affirms that the Bible does not distinguish between prenatal and postnatal life. It attributes human personhood to the unborn child. This extends to the unborn child ex utero as no less a human being than the child in the mother's womb. Later, the paper says Christians should individually and corporately oppose abortion, except under the most extreme of circumstances that endanger the physical life of the mother, and do everything in their power to provide support groups, parachurch ministries, and sponsoring agencies that offer viable alternatives to abortion. Additionally, they say the church should actively oppose the killing of human embryos through the extraction of stem cells for medical research or treatment. The church should oppose the practice of producing more embryos by in vitro fertilization than would be implanted in utero, which would either be destroyed immediately or stored frozen with the strong practical likelihood of later destruction. On worship style, the EPC says the practice of corporate worship in the EPC reflects a variety of styles, which include so-called traditional, contemporary, and blended services. Each congregation is free to plan and execute worship in a style that best serves its members in coming to the presence of Almighty God. Be that as it may, it should be remembered by churches that self-identify as Reformed that both shape and content play an important role in the ordering and leadership of corporate worship in our Reformed tradition. Worship, therefore, should be carefully and prayerfully ordered to include opportunities through song, prayer, the reading of Scripture, and other experiences of congregational participation to give praise to God, confess sin, hear of Christ's provision for our forgiveness, and to confess the faith upon which alone we stand. And also, care should be taken to select contemporary and traditional hymns so that all may rejoice. Words should be appropriate for worship and reflect Reformed theology. Use of various instruments is appropriate unless disapproved by the church session. They should be aids, not hindrances, to congregational participation. The EPC has issued no statements on alcohol, and drinking alcohol is not prohibited. An EPC manual says... The EPC considers a tithe a minimum biblical amount, and gifts are over and above that. Giving should be done regularly and systematically. Church polity is, unsurprisingly, Presbyterian. 
On this, the EPC website says, To be Presbyterian is to be governed according to the pattern of elders, seen in the Old and New Testaments. We are ruled neither by bishops in a hierarchical model, nor by members in a congregational model. Biblically qualified elders are recognized through congregational election, and along with ministers, rule the church corporately. It also means being connected in mutual accountability and responsibility. Just as individual Christians are connected to one another as members of the body of Christ, individual congregations are connected under Christ as the great head of the church. Churches may leave the EPC with all their property and assets if they vote to do so by a two-thirds majority. The Church's Book of Government says this is government by teaching elders and ruling elders meeting in representative assemblies called church courts. These church courts, in their ascending order, are the Session, the Presbytery, and the General Assembly. Churches may also elect deacons, but the Board of Deacons is not a church court. Of this polity, they also say, while this Presbyterian form of government is biblical, it is not essential to the existence of the true church. However, the order of the visible church is best established where the Presbyterian form of government is practiced. On what precisely is considered an officer of the church, the Book of Government says, The Lord of the Church, Jesus Christ, has given three offices to the church. These are teaching elders, ruling elders, and deacons. In higher courts, teaching and ruling elders are also known as presbyters or commissioners and share in the governing of the church. On women in ordained office, the EPC says, the understanding of the role of women in the life of the church varies widely. For example, one Presbyterian denomination mandates that women be elected as pastors, ruling elders, and deacons. Another prohibits this. Yet equally sincere, Bible-believing Christians differ on this issue. In the EPC, the decision to elect women as pastors, ruling elders, and deacons is left to the discretion of the presbytery and congregation respectively. We believe that under the leadership of the Holy Spirit, God's people should be free to follow his leading. They also say, the Evangelical Presbyterian Church believes that the issue of the ordination of women is not an essential of the faith. The EPC is part of the National Association of Evangelicals, World Communion of Reformed Churches, World Evangelical Alliance, and World Reformed Fellowship. The EPC website says that the EPC has sent 125 missionaries to around 30 countries. In 1982, there were 35 churches. A decade later, in 92, there were 174. In 2002, 190. And in 2016, 602. In 2020, 637. In 1992, the average church membership was 316. In 2016, it was 249. That fell to 229 in 2018, 216 in 2019, and 191 as of 2020. Other important Presbyterian denominations in the U.S. include the Presbyterian Church in America and the Presbyterian Church USA. You'll want to watch my videos on those and other denominations here on the Ready to Harvest channel.